All right, hi, um, this is Brother Webb. I am with my niece. This is Amanda Gibby. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually in her house. We're sitting on a piano bench. It's pretty comfortable right now. But um, we're gonna make a series, oops, sorry. We're gonna make a series of videos. Um, the goal is to make a series of videos just to help us to understand Isaiah. And I don't know how many times Amanda will be willing to do this with me, but I'm hoping maybe we can do two or three of these, but we'll see. And if anybody's watching this and we get done and you think, hey, I would like to do that with Brother Webb, you just feel free to message me and get hold of me and I'd be happy to maybe do that. Today, right now, I'm thinking the goal, what we'll try to do with this first video is um, just talk about some basic things about how to prepare to understand Isaiah and then um, some also tools that we can use as we study. And then we're gonna just go through it together. We're just gonna go through chapter one, verse by verse and talk about what each of these verses means or what it might mean. And um, I, I don't claim to know everything or understand everything about Isaiah, which I'm happy about because that means I got more to learn. I'm excited about learning. I love learning. Um, but I like I just would like to share with you what um, what we've learned. And I'm grateful for Amanda being willing to sit down with me and do this. So so let's go. You ready? I'm ready. All right. So first of all, we're going to talk about um, Isaiah in his time. He lived in about 721 AD. Sorry, BC, excuse me, 721 BC. 721 is when the Assyria, when the nation of Assyria came in and captured the ten tribes of Israel, and they either killed them or they carried them away captive. Um, shortly thereafter, they're going to come down to Judah, the kingdom of Judah, and they're going to try to do the same thing to Judah. But Hezekiah is the king; he's a righteous king, and Isaiah is his prophet. And those two together, Assyria is no match for Isaiah and Hezekiah. Their army is just smitten by the Lord, and they go home with their tail between their legs. So Judah is actually spared, but the tribes, the northern ten tribes are all scattered at the time that Isaiah lives. And so he talks about three time periods. Amanda, what are the three time periods that Isaiah talks about? Um, so that's gonna be his time and Christ's time and then um, our time. Perfect, and what significant thing happened at his time? Um, what happened he, to Israel? Uh, Israel got scattered. They got scattered, and why were they scattered? They were scattered because uh, they were being rebellious and unfaithful. Perfect. So Israel in those times, the ten tribes anyway, um, they never had a righteous king, ever. And so they just were wicked and finally God tried, he worked with them, worked with them, sent prophets to them and, and finally he just said, you know, we're going to scatter you. Um, Judah had some righteous kings and some wicked kings. Um, at the time that Assyria comes down, they actually have a very righteous king named Hezekiah and uh, they have Isaiah as I just mentioned. So we're going to start with what my goal is, um, I've, I've got my phone on the screen here. I'm just going to take you through the notes. Um, it's going to be under related content. If you turn your phone sideways and touch these three little dots up in the right hand corner, you can see where it says related content. And if you touch that and turn your phone sideways, I'm just going to scroll. And you can see that as I scroll my phone, you can pull out your phone too okay. if you want to and just do this with me. But you just, I'm just going to scroll with my finger and you'll notice that the related content scrolls at the same time. So when you're studying Isaiah, I highly recommend you have that up and you pay attention to what the notes on the, on the side the related content say because that's going to help us a lot to understand these phrases or words that Isaiah uses that we may not understand today. Let's see, I guess I, Isaiah 1. Just starting in chapter 1. I thought that was a good place to start. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> when you sing, you begin with A, B. No, that's, that's, I'm singing the sound of music now. I love the sound of music. <laughs> yes. What is that? How does that song go? Um, when you let's read, start from the very beginning, the very good place to start. When you read, you, you begin, begin with, with A, B, C. When you sing, you begin with Do, Re, Mi. Yeah. And when you do Isaiah, <laughs> you do chapters one, two, three. Okay, so we'll just start with chapter one. We may edit that out. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start with, I've got a note you'll see up here just next to Isaiah. If it's highlighted, it means I've got a note attached to it. So I'm just going to touch um, the two copy notes up here and see what I've written there. I believe I've got some things I'm just keys to understanding Isaiah. So here we go. Let's start with the four keys to understanding Isaiah. First of all, one in the in second Nephi in the Book of Mormon it says we need to have the spirit of prophecy. Just need to have the spirit with us. So I would just recommend that we say a prayer. If you're going to study Isaiah, ask for the spirit to be with you so that it can help you understand it. The spirit's a big part of it. Two, we have to understand the language of the Jews. They didn't write the same way that we write. Their poetry is different. I'm going to teach you today about parallelism which is one of the um, poetic ways that, that the Hebrews would write. And, um, and Isaiah used a lot of parallelism, and there's some of it in chapter 1. Chapter, or sorry, number 3, um, search diligently. Um, Isaiah is going to take some work. 
anything that's of value requires a sacrifice. Yeah. And the, if you're willing to pay something for something, then you can get more out of it. If you ever bought something really cheap and it didn't last very long? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you thought, man, I should have spent a little more money and got the good stuff. So yep. that's kind of like studying Isaiah. If we pay a little bit more of a price, then this is the good stuff. It's really, really good. Uh, so search diligently. Number four, know the three time periods of which Isaiah spoke. Did I ask you that already? I did, right? Yeah, you did. Yeah. So scattering, Christ time. You can see that there. Um, prophecies of his birth, his ministry, his atoning sacrifice, his death, resurrection, etc. And the number three, our time, the last days, the scattering. And then I kind of throw in the millennium. There's some chapters in Isaiah that just talk about the millennium. And we can make that a fourth category if we want to, but I've just, I've lumped that in with us. So three, okay? So that brings to chapter one. So if, when you're studying Isaiah, the first thing I would recommend you do is read the heading and figure out which of those three time periods, of which of those three time periods is Isaiah speaking. So let's look at the heading. And Amanda, can you tell us, what do you think, just read that first part to us and tell us what time period you think that is. Uh, the people of Israel are apostate, rebellious, and corrupt. Only a few remain faithful. So which time period would that be? This is going to be his, correct? That's his yeah. time. Now read the very last line that I got highlighted there. Uh, Zion will be redeemed in the day of restoration. Oh, so this chapter is kind of divided between scattering and gathering. So yeah. he's going to make promises that he's going to be scattered, but in the last days, God's going to remember his promises and he's going to, he's going to redeem Zion. And I, I think it's cool that they've got the word restoration right there as well. Incidentally, the headings are not written by Isaiah. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so you can actually, they're written in plain English by apostles and prophets, modern apostles and prophets, so you can understand. So always start with the heading, and kind of a fun thing to do if you want to is read the heading, and then read the chapter, and try to figure out which verses go with what it says in the heading. And that would give you some clues, and it like may that, take a yeah. while to get used to it, but it's, a, it's kind of a fun way to study Isaiah. All right, so what do I got up here? The word Isaiah means the Lord is salvation. So that's kind of cool that his name actually is referring to the Lord. All right, let's start with verse 1. Do you want to read verse 1 for us? Sure. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. I just realized we need to make sure that I can take this out. It was on the computer, but... I want on snowball. I was going to do that before. I told you to remind me. Right? Oh, <laughs> it's okay. It's really bad. I think it'll still record. All right. So, um, so we read verse one. So this is just an introduction. This is Isaiah's vision. It tells us who he is, where he lives, and what his vision is concerning. Verse two: Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Who's he talking about? He's talking about all the people on earth. Well, this and is his children, so that would just be Israel. Oh, yes. Okay. So this is about Israel. Don't don't ever don't stray from that. We're just going to talk about yeah. Israel, okay? So I have raised up children. This is the Israelites, and what have they done? They've rebelled. They've against rebelled him. against him, right? Okay. Verse three. You want to read that one? The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. Okay, so here's some interesting things. So now we're going to use an analogy. He loves metaphors. So here's the metaphor. An ox knows his owner. Now look at, um, right over here I've got from number three, if I can find it. Where'd it go? Let me just touch it. Okay, first of all, crib, your footnote, is a stall or a manger. So it's not a baby crib. Yeah. Okay. So the ox knows, the ass knows where the manger is, where, he, where his stall is, where he gets his food from, right? Okay, look what I just did. Edit, edit, edit. Okay, but Israel does not know, oh, I wanted to get this, oh, it's my note here, I think. Okay, so the word um, owner could be translated as purchaser. Now that's a little bit different because you can own something because somebody gave it to you. Yeah. Or you can own something because it was purchased. So here's a question for you. Why do you think, or how do you think Israel was purchased? Who paid for Israel and what did he use to pay for us? Um, I think so, Jesus good. did. And, um, and how did he pay for us? He paid for us with 
um, with his life, and he went through ev everything that we've gone through and felt everything that we felt. Excellent. And what did he do in the garden on the cross? Um, he suffered for our sins. Yeah. He suffered so much that he bled for every poor, from every poor. So the ox knoweth his owner, his purchaser, who, who bought him. So you and I have been purchased with a price. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price of his blood, his life, so that you and I could be redeemed and return to him the Father, right? But what does it say? But Israel what? But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. It's like he's purchased us, and Israel's is like oblivious to it. They're just going on in their sinful ways. How do you think that makes Jesus feel? I'm sure that he grieves for, for Israel. Super sad. And eventually, you know, when our children are undisciplined, we have to discipline them. So what, that's what the Savior's going to do with Jehovah which is Jesus' pre-earth life name. Jehovah is the God of the Old Testament. That's Jesus. That's what he's going to do. He's going to discipline them by scattering them. And then in the last days, he's going to gather them back together. Okay. So this is a great verse. It's an analogy. The ox knoweth his own. I mean, I got an ox that knows where the crib is. He knows where the feet is. He comes home. The ass, the donkey, knows where, the, where it is. But Israel doesn't know. My people, they don't consider. Kind of sad, huh? Whose turn to be my new? Um, I think it's your turn. All right. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquities. Laden means burdened. A seed of evildoers. Seed is like children. Children that are corruptors. In fact, there's some parallelism right there, right? You have... Yeah. Put my cursor for the word here. So you have a seed of evildoers. Seed is another word for children, and evildoers are another word, is another word for corruptors. So he just says the same thing, but he says it using like different words, and he says it twice. One, for poetic effect and also too for emphasis right they have forsaken the lord they have provoked the holy one of israel into anger they are gone away backward so again if you go back to the heading this is all about apostate rebellious israel is corrupt okay verse five why should ye be stricken any more ye will revolt more and more the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint well, that's interesting okay so our footnotes the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint if you look at your footnote five letter C, the word faint could be translated as from Hebrew, the word diseased. That's even that's even worse than faint, huh? Yeah. Faint sounds like you're a little weak. Disease is like, ah, cut it out, right? So stop revolting, the whole head is sick and the whole the whole heart is faint. And maybe head could be a reference to the leadership, because like the head of the church is their leadership. And the heart might be the, the people. So it's all bad. None of it's good. Verse 6. Read that one. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Mint. Hmm. How'd that, how would you like that to be your body? That sounds absolutely awful <laughs> it's awful and that's how he's describing israel this group of people is like a body from head to toe is sick and gross and it's got putrefying sort of like pustules coming out it's like zit heaven okay this is not good <laughs> and they haven't been closed six letter a says they haven't been squeezed out and they have not been mollified the word mollified the hebrew translation you can see there in six b is softened so they're like crusty and they're, it's just gross, right? Um, I've got a little note here that says, Israel had failed to make use of the atonement. They remained spiritually sick and unhealed. So that's how he's describing them. It seems like I had another note in there too. But, but no. Oh, six, oil. Oh, ointment is just another word for oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Seven footnote C. What are we talking about? You can see this TG, which stands for Topical Guide. Uh, the Scattering of Israel. Yes, the Scattering of Israel. So strangers are coming in, they've taken over their land, and they've taken them captive or, or killed them. Verse 8. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. A garden of cucumbers, that's pretty specific. Yeah. <laughs> 
So whenever you see the daughter of Zion, that's a reference to um, Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem okay. is another, the daughter of Zion is another name for Jerusalem. So if you look in at my related content there, um, you've got A, A says the vineyard of the Lord, 8B, the lodge is like a watchman's hut. So it's like you've got this huge garden or farm, and so they built a hut there for the watchman to guard it, to make okay. sure that nobody comes in, kill the rabbits. I don't know what's coming in, eating the garden, but it's not good. So you got your little watchman's hut. How big is it? This is not a mansion. Okay? Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a hut, right? So if you look in the in my related content, Jerusalem went from being a powerful city to being a small dwelling. There's hardly anybody there, and it's been overthrown and overrun. Right? Okay. All right. Any questions about that? Comments? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I just realized I have odds you have evens. You can remember <laughs> that. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Um, I don't remember, remember? actually. Yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah was a really wicked city, um, a lot of sexual sin, and so that's where Lot lived. And Abraham came and told Lot to get out. And so Lot and his family left, and God rained down fire and brimstone and destroyed them completely. Do you know the story of Lot's wife? He looked back. Does that sound familiar? Sounds, it sounds familiar. Oh, yeah. So she, um, oh, I lost She left it. something back there. She yeah. Get, I don't know. But it was her home, and so she had a hard time leaving. Scriptures say she looked back. She probably turned back and actually went there, and that's why she was destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. The point is, in verse 9, is that unlike Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah were completely destroyed. Jerusalem's not going to be, or the Jews are not going to be completely destroyed. God is going to leave them a remnant or a small amount of people in the left over. So, so if you look over in my related content, you've got the preservation of the lineage of Judah. And of course, Jesus is going to come through that line. He's a Jew. So it's yeah. important that you preserve that line. Okay, verse 10. Did I say you have evens? I forgot. Oh? Uh, yeah, I have evens. You have evens, okay. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Okay, so he is, over in the related content, I've got this note. He is still talking to Jerusalem, but he's comparing them to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah parallel Israel and Jerusalem in sexual sin and in covenant breaking or idolatry. Figuratively, they are unfaithful. Yeah. I've always thought it was pretty cool that adultery, which is sexual sin, and idolatry, which is, so adultery is breaking your covenants with yeah. your spouse. Idolatry is breaking your covenant with God. And so God often relates those two, idolatry and adultery or sexual sin with breaking our covenant with our spouses and breaking our covenant with God. It's that, it's that important. It's very interesting. I've never heard that connection made before. Idolatry and adultery? Yeah. Yeah. They sound a lot alike, don't they? I don't Maybe that's coincidence. I don't know. But I've always thought it was interesting what they do. So he's comparing them to, to Sodom and Gomorrah. Go away. Okay. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. He does not really care about all the sacrifices. That's not the point. So you've got Israel who's doing all these things. They're going through the motions, as it were, but they're not really, really worshiping. They don't really love him. They're just doing it because that's what they do. So if you look over in my related content, I've got their hearts were not in it. So their sacrifices became meaningless. We can compare this with us and how we reverence the sacrament, ministry, and temple ordinances. Are our hearts in it? Or are we just going through the motions? When we take the sacrament, happens to be Sunday today, but when we took the sacrament today, did we actually think about it? Or are we just going through the motions? Are we actually repenting of our sins? Um, or is it just something we do because our family's there, our friends are there? Yeah. I know that that's something that I personally struggle with sometimes. Like when when life gets busy, it's like, you know, I'll keep reading my scriptures and I'll keep praying, but part it just like becomes habit instead of something that I'm really invested in with my whole heart. And I think that everybody can relate to that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And Israel's like completely this way. Yeah. They really don't care. I don't think we're like that. And I don't think that there's any necessarily anything wrong with doing it all the time because when we do that we remember when we do need it we'll turn to it. like if I say my prayers every day I might not be really thoughtful but when I need the Lord's help I'll remember to go to him and pray yeah. because I'm doing that I've made that a habit so I'm not 
I mean, we should always be invested, but it's, it's hard in this life to be always 100% focused on what we're doing. So they've lost it. They're, they're still doing these things, and God's like, you know, I don't care if you take the sacrament every time. If you're not repenting before you take it, what's the point? Right? Yeah. Okay, so that's pretty good. Verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths and the callings of assemblies, I cannot away with them. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Do you have any idea what any of that means? Um, That's deep. Do you know what an oblation is? I have no clue what no that clue. is. No clue. Okay, so we can do some fun things with 13. So, first of all, if you look at 13a, it takes you to a topical guide, keyword, hypocrisy, right? We're just yeah. totally being hypocritical. We're doing it, but we're not doing it for the right reasons. Oblations is kind of fun. If you... So I've got this little note here. Oblations, according to DNC 5912, footnote B, which uses that word, are offerings, whether of time, talent, or means in the service of God and fellow men. So here's the actual verse. But remember that on this, the Lord's day, thou shalt offer thine oblations and thy sacraments unto the Most High, confessing thy sins unto the brethren before the Lord. So when he says it here, no more vain oblations, it's when I'm doing those acts of service or things I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm doing it in vain. It's like, I'm just doing it for the wrong reasons. Don't do it anymore. Incense is an abomination for you. Do you understand? I don't know if you understand the significance of incense. Did you get to go see the tabernacle when you had the tabernacle? I did. School? That was that was really cool. Do you remember the incense? Yes, I do. Do you remember where it was? It was, wasn't it the middle section? Yeah. And they'd burn the incense before. Exactly. Perfect. So it's right in front of the veil. So yeah. it's right before you enter the presence of God. And we learn right here. Out of here somewhere. Incense in the scriptures is a type or a symbol of our prayers. So Psalm 120, 141, 2 and Revelation 5, 8 talk about incense is a really cool symbol or type of prayer because what, what, is, what do you know about incense? What does it do? What does it smell like? It smells like whatever you're burning. <laughs> <laughs> incense is not like a normal smell though. It's not like burning garbage. Yeah. It's pleasant. Yeah. It's a beautiful smell. And the smoke goes what direction? Oh. It always goes up. So can you see the symbolism of incense and prayer? Yeah. In Psalm, he says that your, your, your prayers are like incense to me. God is up here, and I'm, when I pray, it's like this rising incense wafting up into his nose, and it smells good to him. And they did that in the tabernacle, but look what he says about it. It's an abomination. Why would it be an abomination? Um, it I goes back to this word. Which would this 13a. Um... I, they again are going through the motions, and I, I think a lot of times it's like the uh, the Tower of Babel when um, they. Sorry, that's what you're they're trying to get they're trying to get to heaven, but they're really it's all in vain. It's yeah, not, it's not real. It's just to act like they're righteous, doing the correct things, but they're not. They don't mean any of it. They're just doing it for show. Okay. You ever heard of the Ramiumtum? I don't think I have. The Ramiumtum's in the Book of Mormon, and Alma goes to the Zoramites, and they got this tower, and they will go up there, and there's only room for one person. And they go up there every day, and they pray, and they say, because we're so grateful because we're better than everybody else. And then they get down off this Ramiumtum, and then they go do whatever they want. I do remember that story. Do you story. remember that story now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's called the Ramiumtum. And that just came to my mind. I'm going to put that in my phone footnote after this, uh, after this video. I'm going to go back and say, okay, so... Incense and abomination would be like you and me getting up on a random anthem and pretending like we're so righteous when really we're just not righteous at all. Yeah. Okay. New moons and the Sabbaths. This is kind of funny. I think I've got a connection here. Okay, so I've got this little note here on 14. See feasts in the Bible dictionary, page 674, and I've got it right here for you. This is kind of interesting. So the law commanded that three times a year all the males of the covenant people were to appear before the Lord in the place that he should choose. That is the Feast of the Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Tabernacles. They had a lot of feasts. Yeah. I guess they were hungry a lot. I don't know. <laughs> this ordinance presupposed a state of settled peace, settled peace rarely if ever realized in the history of the people of the Old Testament time. So there was a period of time when there was a lot of peace. 
It was not and could not be generally even frequently observed. Elkanah, Pius is right, is right, so I'm going to read all that. This is the part I want to get to. So they're keeping their three great feasts. The law also directed that the new moons, that at the new moon, special sacrifices should be offered. So when there was a full moon or a new moon, they also had other rituals that they would do. You know, we don't do those things today, right? Yeah. Although, I don't know if you knew this, but Easter, the day of Easter is not like the first Sunday of It's based on when the full moon is. Yeah. Did you know that? I did know that. Yeah, so that's like carried over from this. That's kind of cool. Um, can I tell you something funny? This is like the funniest thing in the Bible dictionary ever. So watchers were placed on heights around Jerusalem to bring news of its appearance, the new moon, with all speed to the Sanhedrin, who proclaimed it as soon as satisfactory evidence was given. Watchfires on the hilltops told the news to distant cities, so they would put fires on the hills. So, like, oh, it's the new moon. We got to celebrate. We got to do these feasts, right? Now look at this note. Samaritans to cause confusion, lighted fires at the wrong times. <laughs> so the Samaritans, they hated the Jews. <laughs> you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Yeah. The Samaritans hate the Jews, so they ah, we'll get these guys. We'll start lighting fires in, on the wrong days. And so all the Jews are like, wait a minute, we're supposed to be doing a feast right now. <laughs> that is probably one of the funniest, no, <laughs> funniest Bible dictionary entries ever. I don't know. That after unicorns. <laughs> right after that. <laughs> so can, now can you understand verse 13? So bring no more vain oblations, incense is an abomination. I mean, the new yeah. moon status, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. You've got a footnote on away. 13e says, I cannot endure it. So I'm fed up with this. I can't do this anymore. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting, even your most sacred meetings. It'd be like you and me going to the temple and showing up in our, you know, our gym clothes and pretending like we're worshiping or doing the right thing. He, God would be like, get out of my house, right? Yeah. So that's what verse 13 is all about. Again, we're talking about Israel in their apostate condition. Okay, let's keep going. On 14. Right? Uh -huh. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me, and I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will make... Sorry, go away. I will make... Sorry, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Okay, so this phrase, when you spread forth your hands, there's a great cross-reference right here from to, set, to 1 Kings 8, 21 to 20. I think I added it. I don't think it's in your footnote. And I have set that our place for the ark wherein the covenant is the covenant of the Lord, which he hath made with our fathers when he brought them. Sentiment. And Solomon, Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord at the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands towards heaven. So based on that scripture, what does this mean? When you spread forth your hands, what are they doing when they're spreading forth your hands? Um, they're calling upon heaven. Exactly. But so the next verse, and he said, Lord of God. So basically saying, when you pray, I'm going to hide my eyes from you. So that phrase, I mean, we would read that today. Well, I don't know, what's he talking about, spread forth your hands? But it's just a phrase that means when you pray, I'm not going to be there. And then he says exactly that thing in the next line. When you make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. And so I've got a footnote there too. 15, blood, i.e. bloodshed. So they're, they're guilty of violence and other things as well. I think you can really tell to what extent, like how horrible this was when he uses the phrase, my soul hateth. Because I very rarely in the scriptures have I seen anything so um, strongly negative. It's almost surprising that God would react that way. Exactly, so yeah. It's got to be pretty bad. Awesome. That's a great insight. All right, you want to read 16? How many verses do we have? This is one of the thought. 31, okay. We're right. doing good. <laughs> Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings, from before mine eyes, cease to do evil. Um, I just have that marked uh, by the word wash, baptism, right? So come in our day, we do come get baptized and get your, be clean, repent, change. Verse 17, learn to do well, seek judgment. 17, your footnote changes that word for Hebrew is to justice. So seek justice, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Now I want to make a note about verse 17 real quick. 17, there's five things there. Learn to do well, seek justice, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widow. In the scriptures, the number five is a number representing mercy. 
Okay. So it's not in the scriptures really often. Some other word numbers are more common. But one that's a place that you'll see that is the pools of Bethesda. Next year we'll study the New Testament there. In John chapter 5, incidentally, Jesus goes to this pool of Bethesda, and this is a pool where people will go who have afflictions. Mm -hmm. And they sit by this pool and they wait for the water to move. Have you heard this story? Yes, I have. And then they would go down in there hoping that it would move. And there was a guy sitting there, and he's, he's crippled. He can't even move. And Jesus says, what are you doing here? And he says, well, I'm here to get healed. And Jesus says, well, what's going on? He says, well, there's not a man to lift me and put me in the pool when the water moves. And so Jesus heals it. Right there. It's a really cool story. You can read that in John chapter 5. But it's, the, it's this idea of mercy. 5 is mercy. If you look in verse 17, those are all things that are merciful. Do well, seek justice, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless. I think there's another footnote there. 17e, give a just verdict to the fatherless, take care of the orphans, and plead for the widow. Take care of the widows. There's a scripture in the New Testament that says, pure religion and undefiled is this, that we basically take care of the widows and those that don't have family. There's also more parallelism yes. there for emphasis. <laughs> Good. What do you notice about parallelism? Um, We're going to see that in the next verse as well. This is my very technical, grammatical brain. I, I love guess. it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, like you'll learn in English class, like it'll have a similar grammatic grammatical structure and so um, learn to do well seek judgment relieve the oppressed and it's also um, using that voice actively so it's more directly calling for action versus listing things that need to be done like learning to do well seeking judgment no it's like it's more active and there you can tell that like it, it's really important. I love that. I, those are all active things, aren't they? That's perfect. Verse 18, so we're going to see some parallelism here. I think this verse, this is, I've got it in yellow because that means it's a doctrinal master verse. You want to read that for us? Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So you keep in mind what we're talking about. All of these sins they just listed, pretty red. Yeah. Pretty brutal. We just mentioned that, right? But look what he says. Though they be a scarlet, what's going to happen? What can happen to them? They can be white as snow. And then your parallelism is he's going to give you two phrases back to back that teach the same thing. Your sins be as scarlet, they be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, which is also, which is also white, right? And um, I just got to note in here. How do we reason with the Lord? We do it by the Spirit, revelation, and prayer. Crimson was made from the blood of grub worms found on oak trees in Israel. See verse 15, their hands were full of blood or iniquity. So it's the same, the same color of blood. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. I put a cross reference there to DNC 6434. Um, Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and the willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. So that promise is reiterated not only in Isaiah, but again in our book. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So bad things are going to happen if you guys don't repent quickly. How is the faithful city become an harlot? An harlot is a prostitute. It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Jerusalem used to be a good city, used to be righteous, and no longer is. We have to pause for a second because we're not going to see what we're I do need to buy a <laughs> You must be using it a lot. I think it's a leech. Yeah, I think it'll be well, fine. I don't know if I use this, but I think I'll use it. This is why we have the editing tool. Yeah. Awesome. We're almost done. Yay, technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really thought we were going to have batteries, so that surprised me. Okay, turn it sideways. All right, what was I just talking about? Um, we were talking about uh, verse 21. Oh, we just did 21. Yep. Okay. I think I covered it in there. Okay, do you want to do 22? Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. Do you know what dross is? 
I don't. If not, you can read that right there. <laughs> Uh, dross is a foreign matter mixed with anything, uh, refuse, refuse rubbish. Imagination. So, if you make, if you're purifying metal, like gold or silver, they will burn it, get it really hot, yeah. and it takes the impurities out, and it makes it more valuable. So, talking about us, Israel, that's what he's going to do with us too. He's going to, well, this is what's happened, I should say. They have become dross, by silver has become dross, by wine mixed with water. Now, I don't drink a lot of wine, but I'm guessing <laughs> that if I drank some grape juice, somebody poured a whole bunch of water in it and diluted it, that would really ruin the taste, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, again, we're using metaphors. Israel, you're like wine. You used to be so tasty and yummy, and now pff, you're diluted. You taste like water. It's gross. Um, or you got the same illustration with silver. Okay, 23. Thy princes are rebellious. And companions of thieves, everyone loveth gifts, and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. So they're not doing that list of five things that we looked at just a minute ago, right? Yeah. 23b, the word gifts. What are they taking? You find 23b? Uh -huh. That's right, good. Remember, come on the screen. Oh. Bribes. Bribes. So what they, you got your judges up there. Oh, you pay me enough money, I'll let you off. Sound like a righteous people? No. No. It reminds me of the Book of Mormon right before the Savior comes and all the corrupt judges, right? Yeah. They judge not the fatherless. So 23C, they do not do justice to the fatherless. Or the They're not doing those things that we just read about. 24. Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. And I will turn my hand upon thee, Israel, and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. So he's going to take the bad metals out. Right? So 25a, I've got a little footnote there from Doctrine and Covenants 90, verse 36. It says, But verily I say unto you that I, the Lord, will contend with Zion and plead with her strong ones and chasten her until she overcomes and is clean before me. So God's going to have a righteous people. And the way that he does that is he cleanses us, he works with us, he chastises us, he disciplines us until we straighten up. So just like your parents do sometimes. Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a good parent. 26. And I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginnings. Afterward, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, this faithful city. Oh, so what's the key word there? It's that fourth word. Restore. Restore. So in the last days, what's he going to do? He's going to restore uh, Israel, right? Israel yeah. Zion. So that's what we're doing today. We're just, it's a restoration of God's covenant people from Israel that was scattered. Now he's gathered them, gathering them. It's pretty cool. So now we get Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. I was going to mention from um, 26, hymn number 2, the Spirit of God, verse 2 says this, the Lord is extending the saints' understanding, restoring their judges and all as at first. Remember that line? Oh, yeah. That's, I think that's one of my favorites. Is it? In the whole song, yeah. So that's in reference to the restoration of the gospel. He's restoring Israel back to the way they used to be, which is righteous and good. 28. And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together, and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. But they shall be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired, and you shall be confounded for the gardens that you have chosen. So you're like, well, what's wrong with oaks? I like oaks, right? So if you look over in your footnote, 21 letter A, what's he, to what is he referring? Uh, it says... Terebinth. Oh, used in idol worship. Yes, yeah, so when he talks about a garden in the scriptures, he's talking about places where the people would go, that were groves of trees where they would do these horrendous sacrifices, sometimes often with their children, um, sometimes sexual stuff, but just um, offering up, it was just idol worship. So if you read that, you're thinking, well, what's, about, what's the problem with a, with a garden? What's the problem with oaks? This, this is specifically referring to places where they would perform sacrifices to idols. That's what it's talking about. So eventually, 29, Israel will be ashamed of doing that. We're not going to do that anymore. And we don't do that across days. For ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water. I have a couple minutes, I just remember. 
These trees are counterfeits of the tree of life. That's kind of cool to think about trees and, and where we think of trees. Yeah. And then I saw this footnote to John 4. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that speaketh to thee, or saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked him, He would have given thee living water. So that's verse 30. Um, you shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, as a garden that hath no water. So these gardens, these other gods that they're worshiping, have they provide no life. There's no life in them. Up to that's what he's talking about. And then 31, and the strong shall be as tow. If you look in verse 31, i.e. as a tuft of inflammable fire. Inflammable fibers. So you will not be burned. The maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together. Does inflammable mean you can be burned or not? I think it can be used either way, right? Um, I... I know that today oh, it means it's the same as flammable. Yeah, easily set on fire. I forgot I had this note. <laughs> All I have to do is read my notes. There it is. And flammable means easily set on fire. Flammable and inflammable do not mean the same thing. If something is flammable, it means it can be set fire too, such as a piece of wood. However, inflammable means that a substance is capable of bursting into flames without the need for any ignition. The opposite of both words is non-flammable. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's interesting because I've, I've heard them used interchangeably. Yeah. I forgot that I had put that in there, so I'm glad I noticed that. So now let's read it again, now that we know what that means. The strong shall be as tow, which is an inflammable fiber, which means easily set on fire. Um, just recently, who was it that taught us? Maybe it was, I think it was Elder Holland, that said the youth are not like cups to be filled, they're, they're matches or sparks to be ignited. Right? We should be on fire for the gospel. We should be taking it to the world and be excited about it. The maker of it is a spark. So Jesus is the spark that sets us on fire and then we burn together. That's kind of cool to think about. Yeah, yeah. I'm working with Jesus. Is that what you're getting out of that? Yeah. And none shall quench them. You know, put that fire out. So what's going on in the latter days that would be illustration of, of verse 31? What's going on with the gospel today? Well, there's, there's the gathering of Israel and um, God has given people spiritual gifts that allow them to speak in behalf of him and um and to share the gospel in a way that will make people want to hear it and a attract people to the light of christ like a moth to the fire yeah. right? that's super cool i like that how many temples were announced last conference? Do you remember? Oh. I don't know if you knew the number or not. I don't mean to put you on the spot. There's 17. <laughs> Never in my lifetime I ever think the prophet announced 17 te temples and not one in Utah. What's going on with the gospel throughout the world? If you think about it. And the scat, or sorry, the gathering of Israel today. Think it's about where we're taking them. Spreading like wildfire. Oh, wow, that's, that's <laughs> brilliant. It's spreading like wildfire. That is a great place to end. <laughs> the gospel is spreading. Like, I knew I brought you here for a reason. That's awesome. <laughs> the gospel is spreading like wildfire. That's, I'm going to put that in my note in verse 31. I'm going to put your name by it. Yeah. So this is really cool. I can take verse 31 and just touch it like this. And I go note. And then I go. The gospel is spreading like wildfire. Exclamation point. Amanda Giddy. Oh, right. game. <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, I'm still talking. <laughs> it almost got my name right. Then it was like, no, game. And then changed it back. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. I got a little quote cool and I can put that in quotations. Today. That'd be kind of fun. All right. So Amanda, what was your favorite part about what we just did? What did you like better? What did you learn? What was your favorite thing you learned? Anything, any comments you want to make? Well, I think, I think I really liked the end of it because it gives, it gives me a lot of hope um, because it, it can be really really frustrating looking at some of the things that we we see in the world and the polarization of ideas and everybody just wants to find a way to bring each other down and be like no you're wrong and just to know that you know there there are believers and the number of believers is growing and the gospel is spreading and it's not going to be like this forever that's perfect 
there's a scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants that says there's many that are kept from the knowledge of the truth simply because they don't know where to find out. So that's why President Nelson has given us that great challenge. The greatest, if you want to be part of something, a big part of something big, is you know, the gathering of is the greatest thing going on earth today and you know, reaching out and finding those people who are searching for the truth but don't know where to find it. And I think that's a great mission. Well, thanks, Amanda, for doing this with me. I hope that was a good experience for you. I hope you learned some things and hope you're excited to study in, in Isaiah a little bit more now. I'm so excited. Like, there's, <laughs> you know, there's some foundation that we started today, but we could do the same kind of things with them. Um, with all of the chapters in Isaiah. So thanks for being with us and we'll until next time. Talk to you again. Bye.